Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, we have agreed, uh, David and I, that I would be introducing him, and he's going to introduce the other speakers when they, their, their turn comes. So here I am introducing you, David. Well, I don't need to because we all know you. And <laughs> if we don't, we can just look up what was written in the invitation. So I'm going to use the time I'm allotted to uh, make a, co uh, an, a political commercial about the one of the policies of a guy that Max and I uh, think a lot about, and that's Pierre Elliott Trudeau. You see, David, like Max and myself, we are professorial refugees because David, for example, has a faraway university in Prince Edward Island. So, we have been uh, given shelter by U of T and we have been greeted with open arms by senior college. But the University of Toronto, like many host countries, will accept refugees, which is nice, but they're not quite sure that they want to give them equal rights. <laughs> For example, we are not allowed to hold certain offices at senior college. Right. We are not granted uh, library privileges. And what they don't know, at the, what these host countries don't know is what Pierre Trudeau has found out many years ago, that refugees are not a burden. Well, take David. He has greatly enriched U of T. We have seen his um, book club, which has turned out to, which he has founded and is chairing, and it turned out to be one of the most successful and enjoyable activities of, of senior college. So U of T should be grateful to you because all of us at, at senior college, we are, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, but today, David is going to put on his scholar's hat and share with us his deep knowledge of a topic which I find very strange. Intriguing. Islands, very intriguing. Islands. Like when I called myself a linguist, I, don't, I wouldn't have dreamt of going to a talk on islands. But this is the beauty of senior college. We are all discovering what our colleagues from other departments have been doing all these years. And lo and behold, what they've been doing is most of the time fascinating. So now it's your turn, David. Go ahead, we're all ears. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Monique, Monique uh, very much for those warm uh, remarks. Uh, I'm just bringing up uh, the screen uh, and I'll start to, to uh, whoops, to uh, set that going. Where is, why am I not getting it? Uh, uh, here we are. David, if you go to slideshow at the very top, oh, there you go, you got um, it. Um, I wanted to thank uh, Monique very much for the warm welcome. Uh, I too share your feeling of, uh, of um, appreciation for what senior college has been for us, uh, members of faculty and other universities who co have come to live in Toronto and now accept the shelter of senior college in this way. Uh, I think as well now that we're taking these lecture series and going out to allow faculty from throughout Canada to uh, tune in and be able to take advantage of our talks, we're doing it again, senior college, providing a home for retirees, faculty retirees to share their ideas. Um, 
I decided rather than speaking in the usual lecture format and making this all about me and my scholarship, instead to turn around and invite a couple of colleagues, dear colleagues, to join me in talking about islands. The reason for that is that the topic of islands deserves a comprehensive assessment uh, and, and that is best done, I think, by a panel of speakers rather than by a single one. So I, I do thank Edward Warrington from the University of Malta, who's joining us today for coming to participate and for Harold Atwood to do so as well. Uh, I think all of us begin uh, from the starting point of vulnerability for small islands. It seems to be common sense that if you have a small territory with limited population, limited land resources and peripherality uh, added to it, that it of course would have a harder time than continental states would in getting ahead in the world. Uh, and we have had uh, uh, doubts about the viability of small states going back for half a century or more. Um, in the, in the uh, natural sciences, which Harold's going to speak of, that vulnerability you'll see for the natural ecosystems of islands and how special they are, uh, and at the same time, how vulnerable. In our piece, uh, what Edward and I will be speaking of in the social sciences, we will be looking at, um, at that theory that islands are somehow doomed uh, in terms of their prospect. I would uh, remind the vulnerability scholars to first take note of the, note of the fact that no island is an island. All islands live in a wider ecology of relationships. Uh, those relationships of history, of constitutional ties between islands and mainland states, and certainly of economic ties which uh, bind them to continents, to nation states, and even to regions. So the real task is not for an island to try to get on on its own as though it's alone in the world, but instead to how to thrive by strategy. Uh, but to be able to do that, uh, each island must have constitutional status or jurisdiction. You see here uh, that uh, the Institute of Island Studies in 1992 did a very daring thing. Instead of doing what it had done before, which was principally looking at Prince Edward Idol alone, looking in, in other words, insularity, which islands are usually accused of, uh, it decided to look out and to invite uh, 24 different islands to come to Prince Edward Island and to uh, enjoy the uh, shelter of Shaw's Hotel at Brackley Beach in PEI and come and share their lessons of, of the islands, what their constitutional profile was like, how much the autonomy of each of their islands contributed to economic success and to share lessons with each other as islanders. And in that regard, we had sovereign states invited there from Iceland and from Malta. We had the integrated French islands uh, of Corsica and Saint-Pierre and Miquelon. We had um, uh, the re mere regions of the provinces in Cape Breton and in Magdalen Islands. And of course, we had the Federation Islands of Newfoundland and PEI. I gave a speech there at the beginning of this conference on provincehood uh, at how much power our federation gives to the units to get on with it. And I, that time I gave a very fulsome and positive case for provincehood. At the end of this program, after six or seven years of, of working on that matter, I wrote a much more uh, critical view uh, of, of Canada. Not not that it does not provide uh, Newfoundland and PEI with many, many advantages, because clearly it does, and we can speak about those later, but compared to these islands that you see in the center of this circle, the so-called federacies, uh, or certainly to the sovereigns, their, their ability to control the levers of their economic development themselves are very constrained. Uh, I suppose the poster boy at the conference was Iceland because it is such a 
star case of success economically for a very small island uh, territory. But we had others as well. And you can see here, Bermuda was doing very well even then, and it continues to do. So we have examples here of, of the Isle of Man, which is a crown dependency of the UK. We have uh, the Bermuda, which is a British overseas territory. Uh, we have uh, other islands like the Olands and the Azores, which are linked with the mainland state uh, and uh, proceed with their own program that way. The vision of this, uh, of this program academically uh, belongs to the late Professor Barry Bartman, who is a, a colleague of mine in the Department of Political Science at the University of Prince Edward Island, who passed away in 2015. Um, this talk is in a way in memory and in tribute to him uh, and for the deep friendship I shared with him, and also in tribute to the Institute Director of Island Studies, Harry Baglow. It was Barry who put forth the notion of the resourcefulness of jurisdiction, that islands that have an ability at law to make law, to set up a regulatory uh, regime for certain kinds of economic activity, is in a strong place to proceed with uh, development. And the key test, of course, is to use policy to counteract whatever uh, vulnerabilities islands are said to have. That conference in 1992 was quite wonderful and it brought a lot of islanders into friendship with each other. Um, and it worked so well that the, the architects were directed to uh, develop a case study more intensively on a group of islands. So we agreed to do that and wrote up a program in 1994 with six islands, the two uh, Canadian islands, PEI and Newfoundland. I thought I shut this off. <laughs> uh, and uh, Newfoundland, of course. Uh, we um, agreed to have um, it's in fact the partnership, the program between Scandinavia, uh, the Nordifo uh, Regional Agency in Stockholm, and the Canadian Institute uh, at uh, PEI. Our teams under the program were to visit every one of these islands to meet with economic experts and legal experts and business leaders. We engaged in public involvement with audiences in, in all of these islands and with the media. We had consultations with government. And we agreed at the outset that we'd involve a research program and leading to a book publication on the program. We also had sector studies and we placed students um, in uh, the most advanced islands for fishery, manufacturing, financial services. And the funding was pretty impressive. Uh, again, that Harry Baglow proved to be a great leader for administratively leading this program, generating along with Barry more than $2 million to this funding from the Canadian side. You notice as well that we had 35 free Iceland air tickets to allowing us to move our researchers from one island to another. Um, the um, We had uh, as well over that decade and into the year 2000, a whole series of other steps that showed the astuteness of island studies in promoting this field. We had a summer institute, Shirk Summer Institute, which brought the scholars together. Godfrey Baldacchino and I uh, edited, uh, co-edited together the book, uh, which I have here, um, Lessons from the Political Economy of Small Islands. Uh, that came out in the year 2000. Uh, a couple of years after that, uh, the Institute uh, took the lead in um, making a proposal for a Canada Research Chair in Island Studies at UPEI, and Godfrey Baldacchino from Malta was nominated for that in 2003 and won it and kept it for 10 years. I think Godfrey said he might tune in today and, and he's, Mr. he's Mr. World Island Studies Scholar for sure on this. Uh, I'm here, David. <laughs> and uh, we've also uh, 
established at UPI a graduate studies program in island studies. We had an online journal uh, of island studies, a newsletter that kept islanders together and informed on the state of the scholarship. Uh, we also had massive international book and journal publications, thanks to the frantic and uh, very successful activities of, of Godfrey Baldacchino and being an ambassador for the program. We also had at UPEI the UNESCO Chair for Island Studies and Sustainability. So uh, through all of these initiatives, UPEI uh, and Malta became beacons for island studies research. Now coming more to me, um, I uh, arrived on the Garden Isle of Prince Edward Island in 1970 and uh, expected it just be two or three years while I finished my PhD and got some experience in teaching. But lo and behold, I stayed uh, and made it my home for 27 years. Uh, and then uh, serendipity like as well, I found myself led to another island, the Fortress Isle of Malta in 1997 and stayed there until 2015. So this was in effect 45 unexpected years of living on islands. I arrived in PEI amidst a fight against the development plan. Uh, by people who were incensed that the development plan was undermining their vision of a rural prosperous PEI by deliberately reducing the number of farmers and fishermen and rationalizing the island economy, which looked like a plan from away to undermine <laughs> the uh, to undermine uh, uh, PEI itself. And I arrived in Malta in 1997 as well amidst another mighty battle to protect the so-called Switzerland of the Mediterranean from the EU and your encroaching Europeanization. Uh, on the Canadian front, within a month of my arrival in PEI, we had the October crisis, we had the War Measures Act, we had the threat of Quebec separatism more seriously than we'd ever had before, and it was the beginning of a deepening of the Canadian constitutional crisis, which went on for 22 years, ultimately, until the collapse of the Charlotte Cooktown Accord in 1992. And by sheer serendipity, merely because I was probably the only constitutional scholar in PEI, I was drawn in to the government of PEI uh, and had a ringside seat as an advisor and official to, th to three governments. I remember in 1980 serving on a committee on Senate reform, which had all the luminaries of political science like Alan Cairns and and Peter Mikkelsen and a variety of other leaders were there. And we had the privilege in PEI to initiate a, a triple E Senate proposal long before Alberta came up with that idea. So, uh, so that was where I spent most of my work uh, for those 22 years was on the Canada-Quebec crisis. Um, but after that concluded, it seemed almost by serendipity again that the work on island constitutionalism opened for me. I was enlisted by my friend uh, Barry Bartman into that. Uh, I had my doubts with it, but it was a rather joyful uh, odyssey for me to go to all of these islands. Uh, and I do say on looking back, that having done so, I'm both more international and more truly local than I ever would have been if I'd stayed here in Canada. Um, PEI, of course, has a way of describing people like me. We're people from away. <laughs> uh, always guess where we are. And I sense that I always felt that way, both in PEI and in Malta. But I took advantage of those less listening posts outside continents to watch the politics of Canada writ large, the Quebec-Canada crisis, and of the EU on the other, while all the time looking and living in wonderful uh, island homes. So what is the general conclusion of all of this research and activity? 
Well, it is in the series of these propositions. No one size fits all as a destination for islands. And no one should tell any island what its destination point ought to be. You shouldn't push an island towards sovereignty when it doesn't want to go there. And you shouldn't hold back an island that wants to have a larger thing. And current times, unlike the decolonization period after the Second World War, islands are showing they prefer to have a linkage to a mainland state while keeping a lot of autonomy for within the island for a variety of other matters. That's uh, a very important issue. Uh, and I think behind it, it, it was there in the 1992 conference, is sovereignty the only or the best destination for an island? Well, not necessarily so. A lot of non-sovereign island state, uh, jurisdictions are doing better than the sovereign islands are. The third proposition, autonomy is a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient. Obviously, there's the whole game of getting your strategy right and getting your island behind it and making a success of it. Autonomy is just the first step. Uh, we invited Ron Watts, the leading federalism specialist, comparative federalism specialist to join the island work. And he did a whole analysis and a chapter in our book on island um, on political economy of islands, showing that these islands are a world of federalism beyond the federations that we that most that are the subject of most federalism students around the world. Of course, small size is no impediment to economic prosperity nor to state viability. Small island vulnerability is real, but it can be met by a gener by a strategy for generating export income to pay for the cost of your required imports. And if we got to it, we probably could make a long list for vulnerabilities for big states too. Uh, we, I'm sure if we took Canada's example of big state, we could easily make a long list. Okay, that's enough of the political economy and constitutionalism. We're now gonna show more quickly, just some pictures and images of the islands that uh, were part of our program. This is, of course, Iceland with the grandeur of the uh, glaciers, the snow, the climate, and northern lights. You see its location here uh, in the North Atlantic, how far north it is. You also see the whole arc of uh, island, uh, island territories that we were looking at. Here is Reykjavik, the capital of Iceland. Uh, it's a very clean, very efficient Scandinavian city. It has more than half of the population of Iceland there now. But it's showing the whole world how do you heat and, and, and drive its energy system with renewable sources. It has generated a whole industry of geothermal power, which it uses to power its economy along with electricity. And if you see the sea further out, Iceland is a, a lesson case on how islands should or could begin to develop their wealth through the sea. Here is the stats on, on Iceland. Look at its population, 338,000, a per capita income of 67,000 US dollars and for fifth ranked in the world for nominal GDP. Uh, here is the Olands and you'll get a sense of where they're located. They're an archipelago of 6,500 islands between Sweden and Finland. Um, this, this is an example, Olands are an example of a unique um, jurisdiction that was granted home rule by the League of Nations and guaranteed the League of Nations, uh, but was assigned to Finland, uh, but it was a Swedish speaking community. And the uh, deal was that the Olanders were to remain Swedish in culture and language. They were to have as much freedom as is possible, short of a sovereign state. 
But in terms of economic strategy, the Olins were really smart. There they are in the middle of the Baltics. And instead of being a victim, wondering how they're going to have their transportation needs met, they solved it themselves by going into shipping, both within the Baltic Sea and internationally, and later into marine tourism. There you see behind you on that ship, the very image of the economy of the Olin Islands. This is like a super ferry and you can jump on that whether from uh, Sweden or from the Finland uh, and, and take a jaunt, stay over and, and uh, enjoy it there. And they said, it is also the only territory in the EU that is duty-free transactions on these ships. And that was only possible because the Olins, under its treaty, it had to give its consent if Finland were to join the uh, EU, as it did in 1995. And the price for uh, Olins agreeing to this was to remain a tax-free uh, uh, center from EU taxation rules. There's Mariham, the capital uh, of the Olins. It's, uh, and you can see in the background many of the uninhabited islands behind it. Here, this population, much lower, below 30,000 people an income per capita of 33,000 uh, euros in the recent years. Um, I think that's understating the truth of it. When we had our program, the um, Olin specialist there said that uh, the Olins had an income level 40% higher than Finland. But that's not something the Finns want to hear, of course. <laughs> so here's the Isle of Man with the big place between Ireland and England. Uh, and it's decided to set itself up as a finance center, unlike the last two I've just set out for you. And there's Douglas, the capital. If you walked along the Strand, you'd see a lot of these buildings with plaques of, of uh, banks from all over the world and insurance. Uh, businesses every uh, across the world, and it set out to create an ideal and well-regulated uh, financial center. Here again, 83,000 people and uh, income per capita in 2019 of 89,000 sterling per capita. Uh, obviously, again, showing economic prosperity and that through the deployment of smart policy. Finally, we come to the last two uh, uh, and these are my island homes of Prince Edward Island and Malta. Now look at this imagery. <laughs> uh, you don't call Prince Edward Island the Garden of the Gulf for no reason. Uh, and you recognize here the powerful pastoral nature of the PEI landscape. And uh, you see there the luring, unspoiled dunes in the distance, the bay behind that, and the kind of small scale homestead uh, structures. Here you see pure nostalgia, Anne of Green Gables, rural utopia set out there. And look at the colors of the sea, the soil, the cliff things. So, the stats with, uh, with PEI show that it's doing pretty well. It has only a population now of about 160,000, about 48,000 per capita income level, which is only slightly less than the Canadian national average. Finally, coming to the full, full fortress Isle of Malta, you will see here quite a dramatically different imagery. This is Sport San Angelo. The, um, in a way, it could become an icon for, for Malta itself, showing how, in a way, Malta at this time was, uh, it was the center for resisting an Ottoman invasion of, of Malta in the 1550s. And uh, you see, even with its earlier ancient capital, the Imdina, that it's a walled city from which the people and islanders, if they're facing invasion, can retreat behind its walls. And here are Malta's statistics, uh, just under half a million people, a GDP of uh, nearly 15 billion US dollars, uh, 29,000 US per capita, 34th ranked in the world, according to the World Bank. 
So my, this is the conclusion then. Um, we have here a radically different island landscapes, political economies, and metaphorical renderings. These are small worlds of discovery, lilliputs for the good life, provided, of course, at all times that you have an escape to great metropolitan cities uh, when you suffer from claustrophobia or cabin fever. Fortunately, from PEI, I had New York, Boston, Montreal, and Toronto at your doorsteps whenever you needed to escape. And in Malta, I had the luxury, sheer luxury, of Rome, Paris, London, and so many European cities from there. So I, in concluding, I want to say, let's give thanks for islands and indeed for the imaginative sense of islandness itself. I'm going to now stop the share screen. And uh, <coughs> thank you, thank you, Godfrey. Uh, I'm going to uh, introduce now Edward Warrington, my dear colleague from the University of uh, Malta, who's um, who's going to who is I think ideally qualified to speak today. First of all, because he's in fact an islander, and secondly, because on his PhD for Oxford University, he did a comparative study of Fiji in the Pacific, Barbados in the Caribbean, and Malta in the Mediterranean Sea. So that's being that requires getting on top of the literature of all of these areas. Uh, he's also ideal, I think, for speaking about the typology of islands and how we might best frame and group them and understand them. And he's uh, the one in our joint article who truly is responsible for the typology we developed uh, in, that, uh, in that essay. So um, I want to also say, Edward is uh, appropriate now to speak as well because He's also a graduate of the University of Toronto, and we should want to welcome him back. So would you unmute yourself, Edward, and uh, go ahead with your talk. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you for inviting me to this session. It's the first time in 36 years that I'm addressing a U of T audience. So it's a very special moment for me. And addressing them about a subject that as David has said, I have not only studied, but I have lived. I was born on a very small, very crowded, very peripheral island, Malta. The better part of my childhood was spent in an even smaller island, Gozo, uh, which is the second island of the archipelago back in the 1960s. And I now spend part of the year in another small peripheral island, Ireland. Uh, I'm going to speak about the typology of island governance that David and I have, have developed uh, for, for the Island Studies Handbook. But of course, gov governance cannot be detached from the broader field of island st studies. And so I will speak a little bit, a little briefly about that. Let me see whether I can share the screen. Yes, here we are. So David and I were asked by Godfrey to prepare a study on the governance of islands. And our first challenge was to distinguish romance from reality. The first image that I'm going to share is the image that quickened, indeed the experience that quickened my romantic attachment to islands. This is the little island ferry, which went by the grandiose name of Imperial Eagle, which was the only bond between the main island of Malta and the second island of Gozo, in the 1950s and 1960s. It's now a much visited dive site. 
in those days, it carried all of 600 passengers and all of eight cars. It ran four trips during the day. And for certain periods of the year, it would vanish and its place would be taken by a Second World War converted minesweeper. The fortnightly commute that my family and I experienced traveling from Gozo to Malta to stock, stock up on provisions which were simply not available in Gozo in the 60s when we lived there uh, gave me an experience of what it means to live on an island because the big island of Malta to me was not in, uh, when I was at that young age. There was this sense of movement, of detachment, of isolation, a certain sense of vulnerability. Every Christmas, my mother would be desperate to return to the main island to celebrate Christmas with her brothers and sisters and parents. And almost every Christmas, the weather prevented us from coming over. Here is something else, another memory from my childhood, which speaks much more eloquently than I can about the romance of islands. Many of you will remember it from school, school days. Yeats's paean to the lake isle of Innisfree. I will arise and go now and go to Innisfree and a small cabin builder of clay and wattles made. And I shall have some peace there. I will arise and go now for always night and day. I hear lake water lapping with low sounds. While I stand on the roadway, or on the pavement, I hear it in the deep heart's core. Irish people and islands are particularly strongly bonded. And there is indeed a very rich literature from Ireland's peripheral islands, like the, the Blaskets, for example. So the first thing that David and I discovered is that the study of island governance is hindered by a very static and really one dimensional view of islands. The image of an island as being small, isolated, of course, vulnerable, having limited capacity, being marginal and peripheral. This romantic view is largely the view of the outsider the man, like Yeats, living in a tumultuous city and looking at what appears to be the ideal on a lake or off the coast. As we began reviewing the scholarly literature on islands and, on, and particularly on island governance, two perspectives crystallized. There is the external perspective, the observer looking into or onto an island and the external world recognizing, sorry, the external observer recognizing how the external world through history and geography creates facts that impinge on the life and fate of an island. There is then the internal perspective, the islander's perspective, a perspective that is expressed in identities, habits of thought and action, social, economic, and other institutions as well. And island governance is the product of these two perspectives intermingling and shaping the unfolding story of an island's governance or indeed an archipelago's governance. This is the framework for the study which was eventually published in the Routledge International Handbook of Island Studies now in its second edition. The next step in our study was to outline 
to explore an ecology of island governance. Here is one of my favorite islands, now uninhabited. One of those peripheral rocks and stacks off the coast of Ireland. It's the uh, uh, Skellig Michael, which for six centuries was home without interruption and despite Viking rain, raids, was home to a community of Irish or Gaelic monks, Celtic monks. It's now a tourist attraction and occasionally, like Malta, features in blockbuster films. Skellig Michael, despite its small size and the fact that it is now uninhabited, epitomizes the interplay of geography and history. Geography tending towards isolation, isolation permitting or favoring autarky, shaping distinctiveness, identities, determining the balance between stability and change. Geography creates those conditions which propel change endogenously. And then there is history. History plays the opposite hand. It tends towards contact. It permits or favors, or indeed it imposes dependence or interdependence with the outside world. It, it accounts for migrations and assimilations. It imposes or fosters change and evolution, which is propelled exogenously. An island's character develops from the interplay of geography and history, evasions and invasions, the indigenous and the exotic. And this last sentence in red is one of David's uh, invaluable contributions to our chapter. The third stage in our study was to identify more precisely those elements shaping the governance of islands. As we, uh, as we investigated, we realized more and more the extraordinary diversity of islands. You have vast empty islands like Greenland, tiny, densely populated and comparatively well-connected islands like Malta or Singapore. So what are these four elements? Starting from the top, there is the geostrategic role which an island plays in relation to the external world, to the region particularly. Moving eastwards, you have the regime, that is to say the structure of power, which includes both the constitutional order as well as the political system and the political culture, attitudes towards power, towards holding office, attitudes towards um, the outside world, the relationship between those who govern the island and those who are governed, the islanders who are. Is the dominant policy concern? Is it a an existential concern about survival or about guaranteeing employment for an overpopulated island? Is it for many Pacific islands now the consequences of climate change? Is it the presence of a bullying neighbor or an unstable region? And the fourth is the interplay of the islanders collective identity and their social institutions with the other three factors. All of these go to shape island governance. When we distilled all the data that we collected and the island experiences that we had contemplated, we created this typology of island governance. The image I'm, I'm uh, displaying shows the office of the prime minister, which is effectively the seat of government in Malta. And in a later image, 
as you will see, it is not only the seat of power, but it is the centerpiece of the major power centers in the island, the political and constitutional, which is um, the Auberge de Castile, the Prime Minister's office and the Parliament building, high culture, uh, which is just to the left of the picture, capital in the form of the stock exchange, which is off the picture just to the right, and um, in the distance out of sight of the, of the picture, the central bank. All of these buildings, with the exception of the parliament building, which is newly built, incidentally, um, were formerly the garrison center of the island fortress of Malta. Every one of them had a role in maintaining the garrison. And indeed, the Auberge de Castille yes, was uh, the headquarters of the British garrison in Malta. So what about the typology of island governance? David and I identified seven patterns. What's the type of, gov of government? Well, well, that's all. This one here, and give you an example, and then say a few words. Looking at the different types of government, as far as I can tell. Yeah. But why did they use that word that no one knows? Uh, is there a question? Milton, would you mute yourself, please? Okay. So the first is the civilization. And the best examples of that, the island civilization in the modern era are Great Britain and Japan, both of which held among the greatest empires of the 19th and early 20th centuries. In marked contrast to the self-confidence, ex self-confident expansive civilization is the fief. Uh, an island brutalized by an imperial power and plundered by its own elites. Ireland before 1922, Sicily for much of its history since the collapse of the Western Roman Empire, and today I would say the Marshall Islands uh, acquired by the United States immediately following the Second World War and used to test its atomic weapons. Uh, the Marshall Islands remain today in a so-called compact of free association with the United States, which limits their um, sovereignty and does not provide uh, as much perhaps in the way of economic and medical assistance as it might. The third category is the fortress. Malta before 1979, possibly Bahrain today, um, the headquarters of the United States Seventh Fleet, the major um, weapon, if you like, or um, instrument of American military power in the Middle East. In contrast to the fortress, although it shares many of the same characteristics, is the refuge. And I would list there Taiwan, standing over and against China, Cuba, standing over and against the United States. And you might also think of the Cayman Islands as a refuge of a different kind, a place where the wealthy can hide their wealth and keep it safe either from the taxman, if they uh, are uh, resident, uh, domiciled in a stable democracy, or if they are uh, domiciled in an unstable revolutionary situation, um, they can again keep their sta stake, their um, wealth in the Cayman Islands and so many other of these offshore finance centers. The next three are somewhat similar. At the same time, there are some important differences. The fifth category then is the settlement. And examples of that would be New Zealand and Iceland. The plantation, also uh, created by great migrations, but having a different purpose and a different social composition. Some examples of that would be Fiji in the South Pacific, Trinidad and Tobago, 
and many of the other Caribbean, Caribbean island states. And the last, which is the model, the lodestar for probably every single small island in the world is the entrepot, the great international marketplace. And the good examples of that would be Singapore and Malta following its accession to the European Union. Just a few words by way of conclusion about each of these, the kind of governance systems that develop there. The civilization is characterized by stable regimes. It has a global reach, uh, which is both diplomatic and military. It has high governmental capacity. It is culturally influential. The fief, in contrast, is subjugated and exploited. And its politics is one of protest, stagnation, revolt, and criminalization. And the governmental capacity is negligible, except in so far as it extracts wealth for the absentee elites. The fortress is a pawn in global or regional politics. It tends to have autocratic government, although not infrequently benevolent government, government, but certainly autocratic, and communities tend to be disempowered, detached from politics. The refuge is created frequently as a result of a break with a neighboring great power and is created as an act of defiance uh, against the neighbor, both militarily as well as culturally and economically. And the result is the production of uh, a polity which is anomalous, really. So you have Taiwan, which is a beacon of democracy in an Asia, which is mostly uh, authoritarian or at best autocratic. And Cuba, determinedly communist, despite all that the United States could throw at it, in a region which is almost wholly under the influence of the world's greatest capitalist power. The settlement, such as New Zealand or Iceland, is established by free settlers. And this produces a tradition that has political effects of individual autonomy self-sufficiently self-sufficiency and therefore a preference for democracy, consensus, political stability. Settlements are almost invariably affluent societies. The plantation would have been conceived in the global uh, economic system that began developing early in the 16th century and continued into the 20th century but the plantation system more or less ended with the, with the emancipation of slaves towards the end of the 19th century. The plantation is also created as a result of migration, but this is forced migration. And the people who come there for the most part are not only disempowered, but also um, subjugated to an alien elite. This produces a disempowered society and racial cleavages, which have a, a profound effect on politics. So there is a tendency to periodic political crises, a preference for populism in governance when they establish democracies and governmental capacity tends to remain limited. The plantation is characteristic of many of the Pacific Island and Caribbean island states. And lastly, there is the entrepot, affluent, uh, an economic clearinghouse of international significance, nonetheless marked by considerable social inequalities and uneasy or imperfect democracies. You have only to think of uh, how um, or autocratic Singapore's democracy is and in Malta's case, uh, how intensely partisan and clientelistic our democracy is. The state of a, a, an entrepot plays a very interesting role. 
task, generally it is itself an entrepreneur. Quite frequently it is a broker carving out niches uh, in international markets. And of course, it must also act as a regulator of the domestic economy. Just a few concluding thoughts. Here is uh, a view of Castile Square. On the right, once again, the office of the prime minister. Immediately ahead of it is the center for high culture. And beyond that, the central bank, the seat of monetary authority. To the left, outside the picture, is the stock exchange. And as you can see, this is a walled compound in a walled city. So what is our typology? It was never intended to create rigid categories. Uh, typologies are essentially tools that help us to investigate phenomena, to analyze them, and to interpret them, to make sense of a mass of frequently contradictory data. Ecosystems are not static. And therefore, island governance also tends to evolve in response to shifts in the ecology of the island, both domestic and the regional ecology. So it is possible, for example, for a country like Ireland, if you like, to migrate from the condition of a fief to the condition of an anthropos and Malta to migrate from the condition of a fortress to the condition of an anthropos. Island identities and island autonomy has been favored for the past 70 years by the global order created in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War. Dozens of islands acquired sovereignty or some kind of um, federal or confederal arrangement with um, the metropolitan power. But in the 21st century, there are some signs at least, and we explore that, David and I have explored them, particularly through studying how the European Union deals with islands. The future for many islands could be darker. The, the global economic order is less accommodating of offshore finance centers, for example. With the breakdown of um, uh, international legal regimes, islands may find themselves, particularly sovereign islands, may find themselves ever more vulnerable. Um, climate change is uh, an existential threat to many islands. So the future may not be as bright as the recent past has been, but islands are resilient and there is no doubt that governance and the quality of their governance is part of their resilience. That is uh, what I have to say. I've run over rather more uh, longer than I had thought, but I hope it was at least uh, coherent. I can stop share now and allow Harold to take over. Uh, okay. Does that show? Yes. yes, you're fine. That's exactly where you want to be. Okay. <clears throat> so <clears throat> as a roadmap, uh, this is an outline of my topics. First, the species found on islands and how they got there. Second, threats to island ecosystems and the role of humans. Third, islands as refugees for vulnerable species. And fourth, brief comments on the relevance of island research to ecological problems on the mainland. So <clears throat> looking at uh, island species, biologists have long been intrigued by the fact that each island can have unique species of plants and animals. Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace pioneered studies of island species starting early in the 19th century. As examples of unique island species, New Zealand is known to have had several species of giant birds, including the huge flightless moas and giant eagles that preyed upon them. There were no mammals except for bats on these islands until humans arrived between 1200 and 1300 AD. The moas then went extinct about 100 years after the arrival of humans. 
and the animals that they brought along. Another example, which I selected to illustrate a unique island plant, is the cucumber tree on Socorro Island off the coast of Yemen. This modified member of the cucumber family does not exist anywhere else. How did islands acquire their unique floras and faunas? The answer is complex, but we know of two major factors that contribute, colonization and evolution. We'll look briefly at colonization. Uh, this slide shows a model, a colonization model for islands that was developed by Robert MacArthur, whose father was a faculty member here at the University of Toronto, and Edward O. Wilson, who is known for his studies on insect colonies and sociobiology. They visualized an equilibrium number of species for each island with a balance between new colonizing species arriving and loss of unsuccessful species. They also modeled the effects of island size with smaller islands able to support fewer species and the effect of longer distance from a source of colonizers leading to fewer species initially on the island. They obtained supporting data for colonization after catastrophic removal of all life forms the best known case here is the volcanic explosion of the Indonesian island off Krakatau in 1883. And they also had data from experimental field work, including what's known as the Florida Keys experiment, in which invertebrates were removed from small mangrove islands, and then the subsequent colonizing species were recorded. Now, once colonists are established on an island or group of islands, evolution plays a major role in generating unique species. An example here, even a single colonizing species can give rise to many new species through adaptive radiation. Hawaiian honey creepers originated from a finch-like ancestral species that gave rise to birds with very different mouth parts on different Hawaiian islands and in different habitats. Various mouth parts emerged as an adaptation to the food sources in these different locations. Another similar well-known example is Darwin's finches on the Galapagos Islands. The net effects of colonization and adaptive radiation help us to understand how there can be unique assemblages of life forms on individual islands. Unfortunately, a common feature of modern island biology is the impoverishment of flora and fauna by extinctions, usually directly or indirectly resulting from the most recent colonists, people and their domestic animals and plants. In the case of the Hawaiian honey creepers, the arrival of mosquitoes and pathogens carried by them including malaria, contributed to the extinction of over half of these unique and colorful birds. A prime example of extinctions is the island of Mauritius in the Indian Ocean. This was the home of the dodo until Europeans, rats and pigs arrived in 1598. In short order, not only the dodo, but a large assemblage of other birds and reptiles went extinct. I've indicated here two other birds and three reptiles that are no longer with us, except as dried remains in museums. And of course, you can find the dodo in the pages of Alice in Wonderland. The relatively small size of many islands and their limited populations of unique species explains why the rate of extinction of species on islands is much higher than on the mainland. A somber example of environmental transformation by human activity is provided by Easter Island. This island was colonized around 900 AD by Polynesian settlers who created the famous stone statues. Here are some remaining statues, but note the lack of trees on the island. Nothing much but grass is evident. 
as related by Jared Diamond in his book, Collapse, Easter Island was originally heavily forested and included the largest palm tree known, now extinct. The forests were totally consumed during the next centuries after arrival of humans, while imported rats hindered tree regeneration by eating up seeds, fruits, and nuts. As the environment deteriorated towards its present bleakness, sources of wood and food progressively diminished. Then conflicts arose, leading to a decline in the human populations. The overall picture is that unwise management of the land not only wiped out almost all of the original plants and animals, but also greatly diminished the living standards of the human population. As Jared Diamond remarks, it's a clear example of a society that destroyed itself by overexploiting its own resources. Coming to the present day, island ecosystems are under a merciless siege. For example, invasive species, usually imported by humans, have led to drastic alterations on many islands. A famous recent case is the invasion of Guam by the brown tree snake from East Asia shortly after the Second World War. When freed from natural predators, its population rose dramatically and it has wiped out most of the forest birds and lizards. Efforts to contain it have been made, but this is an uphill battle once an invasive species gets firmly established. I'd like to include now some positive notes. Islands, uh, predator free or carefully managed, can provide refuges for vulnerable species. For example, Offshore islands of New Zealand house the Tuatara, a unique reptile with an ancient lineage, the last member of a group that dates back to the dinosaur age. New Zealand itself continues to be the home of the Kiwi, although as noted here, it is now threatened by predators and cars. Efforts have been made to conserve Kiwis in predator-free areas, including Stewart Island off the southern tip of New Zealand, and these efforts have been partly successful. And we must not overlook the refuge value of isolated oceanic small islands and cliffs, which provide nesting sites for many seabirds, such as albatrosses. These sites are generally free of mammalian predators, so nesting sites there are relatively safe. As a small aside, a fictional example of an island refuge in which humans are the preserved species comes from The Day of the Triffids by John Wyndham. Here, people take refuge on the Isle of Wight to escape the rampant carnivorous triffid plants. Finally, island studies have given rise to management strategies that can be applied to mainland ecology. In Ontario, for example, we are faced with diminishing patchy wetland habitat and decisions often have to be made regarding where to put housing and resource extraction, such as gravel pits, in relation to natural features such as wetlands. Results of island studies have indicated the benefits of trying to maintain corridors between reserves and avoiding fragmentation. Whether these findings can be implemented depends on political will in our society. To a great extent, the well being of planet Earth depends on implementing wise management procedures. Hopefully, the political scientists can aid in this. We can only hope that well informed policies will ultimately prevail. A last, a last remark. Um, <clears throat> In our book club meeting on Monday, several commentators, including our lead speaker of today, David Milne, eloquently emphasized the existential dangers of a worldview in which man is thought to be the center of everything, while other species and the environment are thought to be of no account. A future struggle portrayed to a degree in the book we discussed by Nobel Prize winning author Olga Tokarczuk concerns the value systems that emphasize regard for all life forms and the opposing view 
which entails short-sighted pillaging of the earth for immediate purposes, we can appreciate the contributions of literature and the humanities to this ongoing significant conflict of ideas. Although parenthetically, I don't think that astrolo astrology has much to offer. Time will tell how this struggle unfolds. <clears throat> Thank you very much, David. Thank you, all three of you. Um, that was wonderful, um, Harold, Edward, David. I think we should open right up to discussion. Okay. Does that show? Yes, yes you're fine. That's exactly yeah, where you want to be. Okay. <clears throat> so <clears throat> as a roadmap, uh, this is an outline of my topics first the species found on islands and how they got there. Second, threats to island ecosystems and the role of humans. Third, islands as refugees for vulnerable species. And fourth, brief comments on the relevance of island research to ecological problems on the mainland. So <clears throat> looking at uh, island species, Biologists have long been intrigued by the fact that each island can have unique species of plants and animals. Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace pioneered studies of island species starting early in the 19th century. As examples of unique island species, New Zealand is known to have had several species of giant birds, including the huge flightless moas and giant eagles that preyed upon them. There were no mammals except for bats on these islands until humans arrived between 1200 and 1300 AD. The moas then went extinct about 100 years after the arrival of humans and the animals that they brought along. Another example, which I selected to illustrate a unique island plant, is the cucumber tree on Socorro Island off the coast of Yemen. This modified member of the cucumber family does not exist anywhere else. How did islands acquire their unique floras and faunas? The answer is complex, but we know of two major factors that contribute, colonization and evolution. We'll look briefly at colonization. Uh, this slide shows a model, a colonization model for islands that was developed by Robert MacArthur, whose father was a faculty member here at the University of Toronto, and Edward O. Wilson, who is known for his studies on insect colonies and sociobiology. They visualized an equilibrium number of species for each island with a balance between new colonizing species arriving and loss of unsuccessful species. They also modeled the effects of island size with smaller islands able to support fewer species and the effect of longer distance from a source of colonizers leading to fewer species initially on the island. They obtained supporting data for colonization after catastrophic removal of all life forms. The best known case here is the volcanic explosion of the Indonesian island off Krakatau in 1883. And they also had data from experimental field work, including what's known as the Florida Keys experiment, in which invertebrates were removed from small mangrove islands, and then the subsequent colonizing species were recorded. Now, once colonists are established on an island or group of islands, evolution plays a major role in generating unique species. An example here, even a single colonizing species can give rise to many new species through adaptive radiation. Hawaiian honey creepers originated from a finch-like ancestral species that gave rise to birds with very different mouth parts on different Hawaiian islands and in different habitats. Various mouth parts emerged as an adaptation to the food sources in these different locations. Another similar well known example is Darwin's finches on the Galapagos Islands. 
The net effects of colonization and adaptive radiation help us to understand how there can be unique assemblages of life forms on individual islands. Unfortunately, a common feature of modern island biology is the impoverishment of flora and fauna by extinctions, usually directly or indirectly resulting from the most recent colonists, people and their domestic animals and plants. In the case of the Hawaiian honey creepers, the arrival of mosquitoes and pathogens carried by them, including malaria, contributed to the extinction of over half of these unique and colorful birds. A prime example of extinctions is the island of Mauritius in the Indian Ocean. This was the home of the dodo until Europeans, rats and pigs arrived in 1598. In short order, not only the dodo, but a large assemblage of other birds and reptiles went extinct. I've indicated here two other birds and three reptiles that are no longer with us, except as dried remains in museums. And of course, you can find the dodo in the pages of Alice in Wonderland. The relatively small size of many islands and their limited populations of unique species explains why the rate of extinction of species on islands is much higher than on the mainland. A somber example of environmental transformation by human activity is provided by Easter Island. This island was colonized around 900 AD by Polynesian settlers who created the famous stone statues. Here are some remaining statues but note the lack of trees on the island. Nothing much but grass is evident. As related by Jared Diamond in his book, Collapse, Easter Island was originally heavily forested and included the largest palm tree known, now extinct. The forests were totally consumed during the next centuries after arrival of humans while imported rats hindered tree regeneration by eating up seeds, fruits, and nuts. As the environment deteriorated towards its present bleakness, sources of wood and food progressively diminished. Then conflicts arose, leading to a decline in the human populations. The overall picture is that unwise management of the land not only wiped out almost all of the original plants and animals, but also greatly diminished the living standards of the human population. As Jared Diamond remarks, it's a clear example of a society that destroyed itself by overexploiting its own resources. Coming to the present day, island ecosystems are under a merciless siege. For example, invasive species, usually imported by humans, have led to drastic alterations on many islands. A famous recent case is the invasion of Guam by the brown tree snake from East Asia shortly after the Second World War. When freed from natural predators, its population rose dramatically and it has wiped out most of the forest birds and lizards. Efforts to contain it have been made but this is an uphill battle once an invasive species gets firmly established. I'd like to include now some positive notes. Islands, uh, predator free or carefully managed, can provide refuges for vulnerable species. For example, offshore islands of New Zealand house the Tuatara, a unique reptile with an ancient lineage the last member of a group that dates back to the dinosaur age. New Zealand itself continues to be the home of the Kiwi, although as noted here, it is now threatened by predators and cars. Efforts have been made to conserve Kiwis in predator-free areas, including Stewart Island off the southern tip of New Zealand, and these efforts have been partly successful. And we must not overlook the refuge value of isolated oceanic small islands and cliffs, which provide nesting sites for many seabirds, such as albatrosses. These sites are generally free of mammalian predators, 
So the nesting sites there are relatively safe. As a small aside, a fictional example of an island refuge in which humans are the preserved species comes from the Day of the Triffids by John Wyndham. Here, people take refuge on the Isle of Wight to escape the rampant carnivorous triffid plants. Finally, island studies have given rise to management strategies that can be applied to mainland ecology. In Ontario, for example, we are faced with diminishing patchy wetland habitat and decisions often have to be made regarding where to put housing and resource extraction, such as gravel pits, in relation to natural features such as wetlands. Results of island studies have indicated the benefits of trying to maintain corridors between reserves and avoiding fragmentation. Whether these findings can be implemented depends on political will in our society. To a great extent, the well being of planet Earth depends on implementing wise management procedures. Hopefully, the political scientists can aid in this. We can only hope that well informed policies will ultimately prevail. A last, a last remark. Um, <clears throat> In our book club meeting on Monday, several commentators, including our lead speaker of today, David Milne, eloquently emphasized the existential dangers of a worldview in which man is thought to be the center of everything, while other species and the environment are thought to be of no account. A future struggle portrayed to a degree in the book we discussed by Nobel Prize winning author Olga Tokarczuk concerns the value systems that emphasize regard for all life forms and the opposing view, which entails short-sighted pillaging of the earth for immediate purposes. We can appreciate the contributions of literature and the humanities to this ongoing significant conflict of ideas. Although parenthetically, I don't think that astro astrology has much to offer. Time will tell how this struggle unfolds. <clears throat> Thank you very much, David. Thank you, all three of you. Um, that was wonderful, um, Harold, Edward, David. I think we should open right up to discussion.